All right. Here we are. Here we are. What's going on, everybody? Happy uh, Happy Wednesday. I am joined by an equally wonderful smiling face. Paul, what's going on, sir? Not much. Another day in paradise. Awesome. All right. I, you could say that again. Although, is it cold where you're at right now? It's uh, it's Charleston cold. It's it's in the 50s, which is frigid for folks down here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I woke up this morning. It is. I live north of Dallas. I woke up this morning. It was 36 degrees outside. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's way too cold. Way too cold. <laughs> yeah, but otherwise, Paul, it's great to have you here. Uh, we got some big things to talk about for the Lima Charlie community here. Um, I am uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this will be actually a really, really cool thing for for folks to get into and, and for folks to kind of get familiar with. Uh, Paul, I don't know if you want to start out by giving everyone a little bit of a background of yourself or maybe talking about like who Sateria is and, and what you all do and whatnot and maybe how we came together. And then we'll move on to like this new big announcement for us. Yeah, right on. So Paul Lamy, I'm a co-founder at Soteria. We're a cybersecurity firm based out of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, been around since about 2015 and really got our start uh, doing proactive security services, you know, your pen testing and advisory work, technical assessments and so on. And I uh, started uh, thinking about getting into the MDR space around 2018. And uh, as fate would have it, that's around the same time that uh, Lima Charlie uh, went from being an open source project to a to a company. Mm -hmm. uh, we tied up with the folks at Lima Charlie and uh, it was, uh, you know, it was love at first sight. We, uh, <laughs> we started working together. Uh, to build out our, our respective offerings and uh, uh, really built our entire MDR service on top of the Lehman Charlie platform, starting with um, with EDR. And obviously, as we're going to be talking about today, uh, doing a lot of work now with with other platforms. So um, in particular, working with Office 365, AWS and uh, and other platforms that you can pull that into from Lehman Charlie. So uh, we've been doing that for uh, for a couple of years now. And, uh, and now we're trying to uh, you know, make some of these resources available to the to the wider security community and and, uh, and try to help others, you know, stand up their uh, their MDR practices as well. I love it. I love it. So uh, for those of you who may have uh, had a tour of um, Lima Charlie with me before, uh, you've definitely heard me uh, talk about and refer to Soteria. And I'm going to share my screen here in just a second so that I can kind of bring this back home to where everyone might recognize this from. Let's go ahead and tee this up and for those of you who ha ha have been on a, have been on a tour of Lima Charlie with me before whenever I get to talking about the rule sets uh, you might recognize the name Soteria because I talk about the Soteria rules so one of the things that has been a part of Lima Charlie for for quite a while now has been uh, the fact that you know Paul I think you guys have maintained and, and you curate rules geared towards the EDR telemetry side of things Windows Linux and Mac um, around a bunch of different events, ranging from process creation, module loads, network connections, so on and so forth. Um, this is something you guys have had for, for quite a while. And I usually tell folks this is like a really easy to use curated rule set that lets you go from zero to hero really fast, but it's all EDR focused, right? Yeah, that's right. So this was our, our first foray into the space, right? Um, when we started an MDR service, you know, we want to start simple. And uh, mm -hmm. where, where most attacks happening back in uh, 2018, that all happened around the endpoint, right? So. Uh, we, we built a detection engineering program uh, internally, uh, really focused on uh, the top of the pyramid of pain for those who are familiar with that, uh, focused on behaviors and, um, and attack techniques. So we never wanted to really uh, spend a lot of time writing, uh, you know, indicators of compromise rules, looking for IP addresses and file hashes, uh, <laughs> but using all these events that are laid out here, you know, mm -hmm. looking for, for things that bad guys do when they land on systems or they're trying to land on systems and trying to flag those uh, 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 those actions as quickly as possible in that kill chain as we see them and, uh, and give ourselves a chance to respond and, and get them out of there before, a, you know, an incident turns into a breach, as we say. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We've been doing this for a while and, and really uh, uh, we're excited. I, I think man, it's been two or three years now um, talking to the Lima Charlie team and saying, you know, we're, we've got a ton of rules that we're working with. We're maintaining all the time. You know, what if we made this available to the, to the wider Lima Charlie community and um, you know, make sure other folks can, can take advantage of this and make uh, make Lima Charlie more of a turnkey platform for folks who are just getting started. Absolutely. And I got to tell you, that's the kicker right there is, you know, if I'm someone who's 
um, deploying EDR or, or, or looking to kind of get into like that endpoint detection and response space. And I don't have the ability to write or I don't have the time or the people or the resources or the anything to kind of write and generate my own rules and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to have time for that. So I, I'm not going to be able to like start from a good place, right? Where a lot of folks are used to kind of installing an EDR sensor and then all these rules and everything like that are there and whatnot. But nonetheless, um, where this has been really useful for folks has, like you said, been that turnkey approach. And it is a good groundwork or a good foundation for what we're here to talk about today, which is kind of like the next managed set of curated rules or the next set of, of managed rules from the folks over at Soteria um, is going to be a direct focus on Office or Microsoft 365, whichever name you want to go with. Um, you know, I know that I think back in February of 2023, Microsoft went and changed from Office 365 to Microsoft 365. But Paul, I don't know about you. It's always going to be 0365 in my heart just because I, I can't get away from it. I'm also having a really hard time with this whole Entro thing. But uh, that too, right? Yeah, I, I, that, that's another thing where I'm just kind of like, all right, y'all keep renaming. But that's what today's webcast is, everyone. It, it's a quick announcement that you know, the folks over at Soteria have done some really cool analytics and uh, have written rules geared towards Office 365 telemetry and are now making that available for any Lima Charlie user out there to just enable. And as long as you're bringing that telemetry in, you're, you've got now a, a managed rule set against Office 365 audit logs. Now, let's back up a couple of steps and let's talk about like what that looks like from a Lima Charlie perspective. And then I'd love to have Paul kind of tell us a little bit about some of the focuses here. Cause Paul, I'm noticing you guys hit on multiple different applications. This is not just email inboxes. And that, yeah, that's right. Is that right? So we're looking at the suite and I think the biggest, you know, Entra ID is your active directory, whatever you want to call it. That's, mm -hmm. that's the big piece, right? Is how are people accessing uh, the stuff, but, but looking at email inboxes, looking at things like SharePoint, um, some things in Teams and, and other uh, components of this platform. And, and again, just as we do with the, uh, uh, with the EDR rules, looking at what threat actors are doing and, uh, and setting up those traps to find uh, some of those techniques being acted on as they're going. And, and we, really, we really do focus, again, on behaviors. We're not, we're not looking for uh, you know, a known bad IP address you know, hitting mm -hmm. your, your 365 tenant uh, because those, those rules are so fragile that um, looking at at these threat actor behaviors of how they're how they're getting into Microsoft environments. I like it. That's 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 amazing. I, I think you've hit like the nail on the head right there from a detection perspective about where it's critical, where it's important is, you know, I've, I've told plenty of folks this before. Um, Office 365 is itself. It, I know it's an ecosystem that provides, you know, services and functionalities for, for thousands, millions of people out there, if not billions of people out there. Um, however, where you've got these threat actors these days, they live entirely inside of Office 365. You know, I, I can go to kind of the, the default type of threat actor, the, the, the long and dreaded business email compromises and things like that. You know, for, for anyone who, who throws shade at those types of attacks, um, they generate billions of dollars in revenue for those threat actors every single year. So, uh, it, you know, if, if it ain't broke, right? Yeah. Um, but those threat actors and, and the number of VEC cases that I've seen, they will live entirely inside of email inboxes. In fact, I, I once put together a presentation on inbox lateral movement, which was no endpoints were being touched whatsoever, mm -hmm. aside from an email dipping down by a user. But they were just hopping from inbox to inbox and are very skilled at doing that. These types of attacks, to Paul's point, there are very few indicators. Now, there are some screaming behaviors that you can look for. As much as I hate to say it, well, I should say as much as I like to say it, there are some screaming things that the adversaries will end up doing, geolocation codes and possible geographies, things like that. But it's so much more than that now, the way that they're able to use and abuse these different platforms. And it's just, it, it, it's awesome to see you guys kind of um, teeing this up here. Let me, uh, let me hop into Lima Charlie really quick and, and just give everyone a, a little bit of a rundown. For those of you who may be seeing this for the first time, I'll spend just a moment or two talking about uh, you know, how you get that telemetry in and, and where it becomes valuable. So from a Lima Charlie perspective, uh, you have the ability to bring in any kind of external cloud telem telemetry source. Really, any data you want can be brought in. Um, but one of the like important ones here, obviously, for today's webcast is going to be Office 365. And I'm just going to drop a, a, a really quick sample screen here. 
we make it really easy inside of Lima Charlie to bring all these in because we ask you specifically for the different data points that you need to be able to bring this in. We facilitate that cloud to cloud connection, reach out to Microsoft, bring those logs in. And now I've got that unidirectional telemetry screen. And that's maybe the first kind of little tidbit or little, little caveat I want to insert for everyone here. If you're using this right out of the box, Lima Charlie, uh, connecting to Office 365, it's going to be a unidirectional connection, which means we're bringing logs in. Doesn't mean we can't still action off of those. It doesn't mean we still can't detect off of that telemetry as it, as it gets brought in. Um, we do provide some, some links towards ways to set this up. One of the other really cool ways that you can do this, if I go through this particular setup screen right here, folks, it's going to set up a cloud to cloud connector for, from Lima Charlie over to Microsoft. However, if you didn't want to go the cloud route and you instead wanted to have your own kind of forwarder or ingester that you wanted to manage or maybe deploy in a location, um, you know, we've done some work with folks. They like to have kind of those bastion systems or those jump boxes in between and whatnot. We actually, and, and if I went through and provided all these different values, and I'm just going to make this super easy for the purposes of our, uh, of our webcast here, and I know it's not going to be any of these things, but we make it really easy for you to deploy this at the command line as well. So you can set up that cloud to cloud connector, or you can easily deploy this at some sort of a system and have it be kind of that, that connection point between Lima Charlie and O365 in case you wanted to do something like, you know, uh, have a, maybe a point in between the two. Um, we've got folks who will tee those logs off into other locations into like a local file or something, lots of options there, but just know it's super simple. Once you've got the data in, and uh, once you've got the data in, you've now got a sensor set up for Office 365 logs. And this is a sample sensor that I've got running here. It's not going to be very active or very busy. I'll tell you that much right now. But where this becomes super unique and super interesting, folks, is what we've got here now is a timeline of streamable events, right? This is not the index of a SIM where I said, okay, show me O365 stuff, and now I'm scrolling through, you know, SIM events or anything like that. This is a telemetry stream, which means every single field that comes in, every single thing that happens, every event is recognizable, is observable, and then we can detect against. So rather than me saying, all right, now I've got all this telemetry in, let me go write detections against this stuff or figure out how to do that. I can now hop over to the marketplace and just simply turn on Office 365 rules. Now, Paul, let's talk about kind of what that process looks like for folks. And I'd love to hear some more about some of the ways you guys are using these. Um, but if they get this telemetry set up, there's a couple of settings down here, right? You'll want to subscribe to the O3, uh, sorry, the Soteria O365 rules, um, subscribe the tenant to the Tor lookup. And then configure the sensor to start bringing the logs in. So that way the logs are actioning against, sorry, the, the detection response rules are actioning against the logs once they start to come in. Um, Paul, what do you think the turnaround time for someone to get this started up is? Like, I, I have an idea of where I think the longest process might be, but what are your thoughts? Step one, two, or three? I would say probably the... Uh, uh... The, the third one and the only reason yeah. that is you have to go <laughs> yeah. exactly and that, that, that 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 was <laughs> I, I set that stage paul walked right on it was exactly meant to be that takeaway it was the longest time you'll have in getting this up and running here is going to be actually going and configuring office 365 to send those logs in and that's gonna you know once that's set up the data is gonna start flowing in um Paul, I'm, I'm curious, you know, I'm looking through these and, and I think before I changed the way screens, we talked about the different applications and stuff like that. It looks like you guys are hitting the entire O365 suite. What have you guys at Soteria done with this type of visibility, this type of insight? Like, like is this just a, a rule set here? Everyone have fun or, or what do you guys do with this stuff? Yeah, I think, you know, I would I would stop short of saying that we hit everything in the 365 suite because it's growing mm -hmm. every day and, and it's always changing. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, necessarily make that claim without doing my research on a on a daily basis to make sure. Fair but, point. But but we start out, you know, baseline, you know, first and foremost, we gather a lot of what we consider the high fidelity default Microsoft 365 alerts, right? So things like impossible travel or uh, you know the alerts that are generated within the Microsoft 365 platform, it'll spit out an event into your uh, telemetry stream called uh, like alert generated, and we're going to grab those and, and escalate those, right? That's that's easy kind of table stakes types of things. Uh, but then uh, going down the list, we look at uh, uh, a lot of other things. And I think there's something around the order of 70 some odd uh, detectors that are active and live right now. Um, and that, that number is always changing. Uh, but looking for 
things that, that bad guys do when they land in an inbox, right? Or land on a, on a Microsoft 365 account. So uh, one of the uh, one of the biggest ones that you mentioned BEC, that's that's the world we live in. You know, ransomware gets all the uh, all the headlines and, and BEC happens in the background. Nobody hears about it. But as you said, it, it's a billion dollar industry. And uh, uh, the, the volume of incidents is, is certainly much higher on that side from our perspective anyway. Hmm. So we'll look for things like manipulating incoming emails. That's a, a fan favorite that, that these guys like to do, right? If, if they're sending some uh, some illicit communications um, you know, from your account to someone else, they want to create these inbox rules to um, you know, route them to a folder where you're not going to see them or delete them. Or maybe they want to be a bit more sophisticated and set up some transport rules um, for the entire tenant uh, that will hide some of those things. So we look for those types of, of activities that, that we see over and over again in these incidents. Uh, we look for uh, a lot of tampering with security settings, um, which, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you'll find that and that's just, uh, you know, it, it's a multi-value type of thing, right? We see threat actors doing that, but sometimes we see people with admin privileges who probably shouldn't have admin privileges going around and, and turning off settings. So, mm-hmm. uh, so we take a look at that as well. Uh, authentication. Uh, types of things. So uh, within Entre ID, if you're setting up a federated domain, this is a, a tactic that's been used in, in Microsoft environments as well as uh, as well as Okta, right? Where you don't want somebody to see you creating new users or creating new admins. So instead of creating a new admin user, you can create a whole federated domain that you can add and remove users as you wish, uh, pretty much invisibly. So we'll look for those types of things or people adding new admins or adding um, uh, new users with sensitive roles. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, legacy authentication. So that's a that's a big one as well. I'm looking for folks logging in with, uh, you know, just uh, the old uh, basic authentication, which Microsoft said that they were going to disable on all tenants. But that's, you know, in our experience. No, sir. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, maybe maybe one day we'll get there, but it's still certainly happening. Uh, tons mm-hmm. and, and that's what, you know, threat actors rely on that a lot, as well as some other things like SharePoint is, is used a lot of times and OneDrive is used to um, to distribute malware to other folks, so creating um, creating a, a, a SharePoint file that's uh, available anonymously to anyone on the internet, you know that could be indicative of an attack. It could be just indicative of, of somebody setting too broad of permissions on something that needs to be corrected and, and creating an issue there. Um, so looking across those those applications as well of of, uh, of folks like you know sideloading Teams applications and so on and so forth. So it's really you know it's across the board things that, that we've seen either directly in our incident response practice or as we're investigating incidents that we detect through our MDR practice or just things that we're reading in, in other people's research of saying, you know, we should we should look for this and catch it. And I'll say that, you know, you mentioned the the Tor look up there too. We also look for logins from Tor addresses because that's that's another mm-hmm. kind of table stakes, right? You, you probably don't have that happening a lot and it's a it's something that um that should be looked for. But but what yeah. I would recommend to people is is in addition, you know, there we're we're looking for these active uh, attack vectors, uh, but I wouldn't recommend necessarily that folks just like start and stop with our rule set, you know, right off the gate, right? Uh, you can you can add things to customize it. So, for example, you live just north of Dallas, Matthew. Uh, Matt, yep. you, you, you have a company and you're all sitting there, you know, in Texas. Maybe it's not a bad idea to write your own rules to look for people logging in outside of Texas or outside of the United States if you know your team doesn't travel a whole lot. Or, you know, if you've got these other kind of parameters that you can put onto it. So we provide that that baseline uh, generic detection capability that says, "Hey, here's here's attacks that we see all the time that are broadly applicable um, uh, to a lot of organizations. You, they're not going to cause you too many false positives. Uh, they're not going to cause you too much noise. But you can go and add layers onto that that are that are more specific to your business. And, and we would certainly recommend that uh, that folks do that. And yeah. And the other thing that that we uh, that we talk to folks about is like making sure that your environment is set up securely in the first place." Because that's uh, you know an ounce of prevention being worth a pound of cure and all that. If you can, if you can lock down your environment to prevent these things from happening in the first place, and then you know I would love it if, if folks who subscribe to our rules never got a single alert because everything's locked down tightly. So um, there's a lot of resources out there to do that. We've been really focused on this Microsoft 365 space as a company for the past couple of years. You know we've put out um, uh, an open source project called 365 Inspect to allow people to go and and look for security misconfigurations within their tenants that has some overlap with I our remember rules. that. That's right. Yes. So there's there's overlap with our rules where there's some things that you can go and look at an environment and look for federated domains and look for um, uh, uh, 
look for uh, people who have inbox rules that, that are pretty suspicious. And you can, mm -hmm. if you're just starting with MDR, then doing something like that to understand, you know, the baseline of where you start, because MDR is not going to catch something that's already compromised and they've already got all the infrastructure in place, right? So uh, we're, we're looking at these logs coming in, but doing that baseline right up the front is a, is a good approach as well. And then, and we're working on that all the time as well of, of trying to secure um, uh, those environments. We're working, we have a SaaS app uh, that does the same type of thing as, as more of an enterprise version of it called Zotarian Spec. So there's there's the MDR piece, but there's a lot more that folks should be doing with um, with their Microsoft 365 environments to, uh, to lock these things down and, and prevent this from being an issue in the first place. Because yeah. You've probably seen this, Matt. You walk into a place, you you put in the greatest monitoring, and, and then you realize that you know it's been compromised the whole time. And um, you know you monitor and you find something like two or three months later, when a threat actor sticks up their head and, and does something, but um, but it could have been called sooner had you you know kind of done that hunting and inspection ahead of time. Oh yeah, no. So this is like Paul is speaking such a source of truth here, everyone. I mean, one of the one of the things to to consider or or, or to remember about these office 365 environments and whatnot is that first off uh you, you've got threat actors who know these environments very very well so paul some of the first types of attacks that you talked about um were identification identity authentication authorization types of attacks and things like that you know we're talking about i think you talked about active directory federation um we get into things like golden saml attacks and, and all sorts of things where you know you've got an adversary who understands some of the complex relationships between the way that uh, domains can be deployed. And I'm, I'm speaking a little bit vaguely here with intention, uh, only because every single environment is, is a little bit unique and a little niche. And sometimes there's like exceptions made in certain places. I think Paul, you talked about admins having just way too much power in some cases. That's another common byproduct, especially when you get companies that have grown via like M&A and stuff like that is they've just had to bolt pieces together. It, it hasn't been like an organic, we grow as we grow kind of thing, right? Um, and, and I think adversaries have, have figured out those, you know, those, those gaps there. Uh, being able to, you know, have detection rules against that is, is absolutely absolutely huge. BEC being, of course, like the staple, right? Now, I want to talk about one thing you brought up there, Paul, because this is one that I've seen as a really interesting little takeaway for folks. And I, I like telling this, this war story a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, you talked about um, insecure uh, authentication protocols or legacy authentication protocols. Um, quick FYI for everyone here. Uh, another thing that you can look for, um, is, Paul, I'm assuming your rules go for this too, is there are email protocols that default to single factor authentication. Um, and whether you've got, you know, MFA turned on and all the amazing things set up and whatnot, your email protocol, if it's allowed, might be the one that downgrades you there. Furthermore, quick little pro tip for everyone, there are some applications and some operating system versions that have not yet upgraded to the newer protocol versions or adversaries refuse to. So for the longest time, when I did a lot of O365 investigations, I would keep running into these threat actors who are using Mac 10.9 for wow. their intrusion wow. and stuff. Mac 10.9. And for the longest time, I was like, I can figure out the adversary is using a Mac. It's 10.9. And what it was was that mail client would default to IMAP. Yep. whenever they were syncing an inbox over. Um, so it would default to IMAP, which is a single factor protocol. And they were, boom, they were in from that mechanism. So I think, you know, the other thing that you guys do here, Paul, is, is, you, is you help folks kind of realize just how vast these types of attacks can be, or I should say how vast of an attack surface O3, O365 can be, but then also um, the breadth of threat actor coverage in here as well. And, and for anyone who, who do, isn't aware, um, O365 is not just financially motivated adversaries. It's the target of, of, of everything from APTs to opportunistic adversaries. Red teams love it. Purple teams love it. Pen testers love it. It is just a lot of times you're able to find, you know, the, those significant gaps or, or holes in the firewall, for lack of a better term, that would be, you know, uh, an easy vector or an easy way in. Um, the folks over at uh, Black Hills InfoSec, I believe, have actually put together like a guide on attacking Office 365. Yeah. Um, of course, from a from a pen testing perspective and whatnot, they have. But uh, you know, it, it, it's it's been a it, it's been an interesting um, uh, thing to have. Paul, one other tool that you mentioned that I wanted to bring up here for folks was uh, 365 Inspect. And I remember when you guys came out with this one, um, and I actually remember kind of talking about this one as well. Folks, we'll drop this link into our community Slack for Lee Matali, but I highly recommend 
you know, in a di if you've got an Office 365 instance that either you maintain or you maintain or, or manage or monitor for, for another customer, um, I, I cannot recommend more like the two things that that Soteria is offering us now, you know, today. The first being the managed rule set we've talked about, but then also this like security assessment tool that goes through. And I'm going to scroll right down to some of the really cool results here where it goes through and it talks about, hey, we identified and found this particular thing. Um, you know, here's some remediation options and stuff. Paul, I, I know this wasn't like the main goal of today's webcast, but do you want to take a moment and just tell us like, did this come about from the same type of work? Like you guys just saw the same thing again and again and again? Yeah, it, it really is. So this is actually, uh, it's something that's used by primarily our advisory team nowadays, but it was born out of our incident response practice. And and going back to what you, um, you were getting at there, you, you work so many, uh, BEC incidents and, and other incidents that, uh, you know, you find that the initial entry vector is uh, Office 365. And, and we started seeing the same thing. So it, it really started with saying, hey, there's there's PowerShell interfaces into all this Office 365 stuff. It would be great if when we get into a new IR, we got a, a 365 environment. Let's just go check for, you know, do they have any weird forwarding rules across any of their users? Do they have MFA enabled and do they have basic authentication enabled? I think were the, the three things we wanted to check for at first. So team whipped together a, a PowerShell script and then, uh, you know, kind of grew and grew and grew over time. And then uh, the, the, the natural thing is, well, we're doing all these assessments and we used to do the, uh, the assessment work where you'd go and, you know, either shoulder surf or ask for a domain admin account or a, a global admin account in 365 and go click through the settings and go through your checklist and, and check things off. And, um, you know, we figured there's gotta be a better way. So that's, that's really where this was born out of is saying, okay, well, let's, let's build a, a, uh, an extensible kind of plugin based PowerShell script that will allow mm -hmm. us to go through and, and look at all the things that we want to look at in a, in a deep dive assessment, just flag those up to us. And it's not, you know, it's not an assessment, right? It's not an automated mm -hmm. assessment. I hate that word because when you when you pull that up, it's going to look at everything on 365. So if you have Duo for multi-factor, the script's going to say, "Hey, you don't have multi-factor because it's not visible in right, 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 yep, right." So it's a it's a way to gather this information and um, and get a good starting point, um, but you still have to go and and um, you know pay attention to the results and, and put some thought into it. Uh, but it's uh, uh, we've had great feedback. We put it out there, I think, uh, a, a year and a half, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, have gotten a ton of feedback from the community. Have had a lot of features, and and um, one of the things that uh, that we heard over and over from our customers is, uh, hey, you know, we love this, but I don't want to run a PowerShell script all the time and have to, you know, plug in my global admin credentials to uh, to do this. So, uh, so we built a uh, a SaaS version of this as well that uh, that folks can uh, subscribe to and, and such. And that's a another line of business that we're building out as well. Just nice that's awesome those. i love it there we go so you know for anyone who's watching um and we have it we have had one question come through that i think i'll address in, in just a moment i see it's being asked as well but um you know for anyone out there who's got to deal with this type of telemetry or these types of environments and things like that you know it, it's it's a huge starting point to be able to just kind of enable and turn this stuff on and say hey I, I, I need a place to start as I work to like build out my own core of detections or understand a little bit more about how this telemetry might be used and whatnot. Um, now, one thing to note for folks about kind of the workflow and the way that this comes together, switching back to the managed Office 365 rule set here, um, the way that it works is, you know, we talked about the settings earlier. Once you've got the, the you're subscribed to the rule set and the telemetry starts to flow in, um, what will happen is the detection and response rules will automatically be applied to your organization and then you'll start to receive detections based on the type of behavior that come through and whatnot um we, we did have one question come through uh paul which was kind of asking about like what types of things or what types of detections there i think someone was looking for like a preview of what the detection alerts may look like and stuff like that um i know we don't have that displayed here i will say just on behalf of the team here and whatnot if you go take a look over at the blog post which i threw in the chat of um you know, the, M3, the 365 inspect, I think some of the different types of, of things that Paul talked about earlier, um, you'll see, you'll see reference in there. In addition to, you know, some of the authentication stuff we talked about, uh, federated active directory and, and or AD, ADFS and things like that um, would, would be worth looking for. But for anyone who's curious about the types of rules that you'll see or, or the types of content you might observe and stuff like that, I would say it would likely, you know, go look at how folks are attacking Office 365 and then just think about the inverse, yep. right? Yep. And Eric, um, Eric mentioned in the chat as well that uh, if you subscribe to them, which you can do on the free tier without having to pay anything, and you go to the DNR rules section, you can see a list of the rules and the names are pretty descriptive. So I think folks should be able to uh, um, 
to get a good idea of what we're looking for uh, within those rules. Gotcha. Well, in that case, then since we're uh, since we're here, let's try it live. Um, let's uh, let's see. Let's, 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 let's do it live. Here we go. So yeah. here we go. We've got some uh, M M three sixty five rules. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, let's see. I'm going to copy this little thing right here. So for anyone curious, um, we'll drop this in. So there we go. Uh, a bunch of different rules here. I'm folks. I'm going to scroll through them. We're not going to go one by one, of course, of these. But the, you know, impossible travel alerting for you know terminated user. Oh, I love that one right there. Terminated user is fantastic. Um, that is that is great. I'm assuming is that something I need to feed content into, Paul, or or, or how does that one work? If you can tell us, uh, let me let me take a look real quick because I don't have it off the uh, off the top of my head. But I can get you. All right, while he's doing it. that, I'll look through a, a couple others here, um, folks. Th these are ones that are getting into like really typical threat actor techniques, right? Delegation of mailbox, owner permissions, um, DLP compliance, disabling temperament. Uh, MFA being disabled, logging from a Tor node. I mean, come on, that should just be everywhere. Here we go. New federated domain. We're getting into things here like um, policy rules, declarations and things like that. Uh, I'm looking for share. Here we go. SharePoint ones. This is another one where a lot of folks don't know what they don't know because SharePoint is something that everyone in the org has access to. And you never know what someone is generating or sharing or, or putting out there and stuff. So I think having, you know, a, a little bit of, of visibility around that is, is going to be super important. But this one right here, I'm going to tell you all this one right here of a new inbox rule being created in Microsoft 365. This is a billion dollar rule right here because it has the ability to stop billions of dollars of money flowing out the door. Um yeah. But yeah, this is awesome. I, I love this, Paul. Did you have any insight into that uh, that one we were talking about? Yeah, so Microsoft generates some telemetry when uh, if a user is terminated, their account's terminated, and they still try to do some stuff after um, after that termination, then uh, Microsoft will generate a, an, an event within their telemetry for that, and we catch and flag those things. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. So we had an interesting question come through which uh, is, is, is coming through right here now, which said what O365 license or subscription level is required for this rule set to have 100% coverage? Uh, Paul, if you have the easy answer for that, I have the long roundabout answer, yeah. um, but I, I, will, I will offer folks some insight here into what that question is, is around. There's, it's, it's really easy at, a, at an incident response level to just be like, oh, just grab O365 logs and you're set, yeah. right? Because in an incident response, it's like, just get everything and go. Um, typical monitoring though, obviously is going to depend on licensing levels from certain vendors and things like that. I believe Microsoft has actually opened up audit logs for almost every level. Is that right? Yeah. So I would say, I would confidently say E3 licenses and above, uh, okay. for, uh, for this, uh, you know, Microsoft said, and I haven't gone back to independently verify this, so um, don't quote me on it, but. You know, after the after the incident that happened earlier this year um, with APTs getting into Microsoft's back end and going after some U.S. government targets, uh, mm -hmm. Microsoft did commit to um, to enabling higher fidelity logging to lower tiers of Microsoft 365. And, and the belief was that everybody was going to be able to get your unified audit log. And yep. uh, and for the you know higher tiers, there would be some more enhanced fidelity um, within some of those events. So I, I believe and. You know, if you have your unified audit log and you're capturing uh, that data, then uh, that's really what we're pulling from is, is that uh, unified audit log. And in the Lima Charlie docs, I would say are pretty good about de uh, defining the possible log streams that you can pull from um, yeah. to set up the, uh, the adapter. So if you can capture those log events, then um, uh, then you should be good to go. And that's a non-answer and I get that, but uh, that's, that's the best one I have off the top of my head. And it will probably change tomorrow because Microsoft is, <laughs> that's how they do things right so i pulled this up uh the microsoft's documentation was edited seven days ago for anyone who's curious here now now there's there's a reason why we don't kind of lead with the microsoft licensing requirements primarily because neither paul and myself obviously work there number one number two because it might change tomorrow um typically historically it used to be an e5 thing e5 and above is where you got the good log visibility um to paul's you know paul you hit the nail right on the head uh for anyone who, who doesn't know uh, welcome to security Microsoft had a massive incident earlier this year and 
they opened up audit logging to non or I should say below E5 licenses, which is just pretty much an E3 license um, where it changes. And, and I, 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 I am inadvertently highlighting a huge benefit of using like Lima, Charlie and Soteria together here. But uh, a huge benefit is, you know, depending on your license level, your logs may be retained for only 180 days within Microsoft, 180 days to a full year. Um, so if you are on a sub E5 level and you bring them into Lima, Charlie, you will get a full year of retention coupled with that. So there might actually be a way to, you know, kind of get around that there. Um, and then, Paul, I think to your point, visibility levels might change a little bit. You might get a few more details. Um, so, it, you know, for everyone who's curious here, and, and I don't want to spend too much time going through Microsoft's recommendations and stuff like that. Uh, these are very valuable audit logs to have. But there are obviously caveats to everything. Um, they do drop in. Sometimes there might be lags in time periods and stuff. And that's a Microsoft thing. Um, you know, they, they, they do talk about outages. But, you know, I'm looking at this one that highlighted this right here. Core services, Exchange, SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, audit record availability might be 60 to 90 minutes after an event. Some, I've never seen it stretch that full window, but just be aware that sometimes these things can have a, a slower, uh, you know, pull in as opposed to like, you know, an instantaneous thing right off the wire. So just be aware when you configure and set up these these types of, um, you know, these types of things. And, and for the questions that are coming through or folks who are wondering like, well, wait, what about this subscription? What about that subscription? Um, I, I would I would argue and say, and Paul, you tell me if I'm wrong here, but if the telemetry is not there because of the licensing level or something, then the detection just won't fire. That That's correct. Yep. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and we try to, you know, we, we'll pull and, and Ken asked a question about the, the impossible travel. And I'm not sure offhand what the, what the license level is for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but anything that starts with the word alert is a built in 365 alert that they generate. Um, and I know we've seen those in, in organizations that I believe have E3 licenses. So I, I don't think you have to have E5 these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but but anything that starts with the word alert is based off of Microsoft's own internal alerting, and we're just flagging those types of things, right? Ah, gotcha. Okay, all right. So good to know. So then some of the alerts are passed on from the platform, and some of the guys, some of the things are our logic that that you guys are are implementing here. Amazing. Okay, right. great. I love that because then you kind of get the best of both worlds in here as well. As I get Soteria's logic, and then I also get um, you know the the Microsoft logic set in there as well. Um, amazing. Awesome. The last little thing I wanted to mention about the rule set here, and this definitely goes outside of the scope of like normal daily monitoring typically, but you know, for those folks in that like traditional forensic element and stuff like that, there's obviously e-discovery capabilities and whatnot baked into Office 365. Paul, I love that you included some of these in here as well. You know, e-discovery e e e case added, uh, search conducted, export, things like that. These are not inherently malicious activities whatsoever. But it's great to know kind of just like what's going on in the environment and whatnot. So I'm super glad you guys included those because it does give that just overall awareness of what's happening yeah. there. So and, and I would say a lot of our rules I would consider kind of threat hunting types mm -hmm. of rules um, because there are obviously very legitimate reasons to do um, e-discovery searches. Uh, but we've also used uh, or seen that used to to do exfil of, of inboxes, right? If you want to exfil an inbox and you do have... Um, you know, no legacy uh, authentication. And it, sometimes it's easier to just do a, a new discovery search and, and search for whatever sensitive data you're looking for that way and, and pull it right out of the platform. So it's uh, uh, it's one of those things that usually is uh, is legitimate, but uh, it's worth looking into. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's another one of those things where, right, as, as, as a SOC monitor, as an analyst, security analyst, as an incident responder, whatever it might be, not every rule that trips is going to be bad. Like, let me be clear, right? Inbox rules are not inherently malicious. They just happen to be used 99% of the time for malicious yeah. purposes yeah. and whatnot. Um, awesome. and, and, I'll, and I'll say we don't, we don't trigger on every inbox rule, right? There's, uh, so we put some, and that's, you know, I, it's not secret sauce, but that's that's the effort that we go into. It's not just looking for a new inbox rule, but uh, we try to filter out some of the the more common benign things. But if you're if you're inbox rule forwarding to an external address, then that's at best usually a policy violation, right? Yep. If, uh, and and it works a, a threat actor, or if you're um, you know trying to uh, trying to hide anything that that says like you know new invoice, that's a that's a good sign for um, uh, for a. Uh, business email compromise and there's some folders that particularly uh, threat actors usually love to um to to drop the messages they're trying to hide into so rss we, feeds uh, yep <laughs> conversation history you know yep yep you know, it's uh so we, we try to uh 
you know, it's it's not perfect, but we do try to to strike that balance between giving good fidelity on on bad things that are going on in the environment and not just overwhelming you every time somebody creates a, a rule to try to organize their inbox a little bit. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's one of those things where, you know, uh, I, I, I often, the thing that I love about these types of detection rule sets as well, and, and by the way, everyone, happy to answer any more questions or more feedback that might come through. But one of the other things I'll mention about these types of rule sets here is, you know, it's, it's one thing as a security analyst, as an incident responder, whatever role you're in, you're going to see some stuff as you go through and kind of work through your career and whatnot. It's hard to get a scope on just how vast of an attack service you may be. You know, even if I've got 99% of this thing covered in my head, um, there's other ways for adversaries to take advantage of it that might like trip the diff you know, trip a rule that I wasn't aware of before or something like that. I just, I love the coverage there. Another thing that you guys did, which I, I was a huge fan of, um, I clicked into a rule here just to show this, but I believe you've also got the miter attack techniques associated with these as well. Yep. Um, so another huge benefit for folks, because if I'm looking at these rules or I'm in Lima, Charlie, guess what? Um, attack becomes an actual thing that I can pivot off of. It becomes part of like the query and stuff like that. So there's a lot of value there um, in kind of having those keywords or having those tags associated with that detection and response rule. It means you can, you know, trigger and, and do different stuff inside of the platform as well. Well, uh, Paul, this has been awesome. Like I, I've, I've been a huge fan of, of kind of watching this thing come to light. I'm really big fan of seeing this happen. Um, again, someone who's gone through and investigated way too much O365 in my time. This is amazing. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming from the audience. So I'll give everyone just a moment or two to ask any questions, but I'd love it if you've got some maybe final party words for everyone on kind of like, you know, some things about Soter is working on or, or anything else coming down the line. We, we, we'd love to hear about it or, or, you know, where you find these rules offering the most impact. Yeah, <clears throat> I think the... You know, first and foremost, these uh, this is never done. So, as uh, as folks subscribe to this, the the rules are going to be changing on a regular basis, and we have a, a detection engineering uh, process uh, that that pumps new rules or edits to existing rules, and sometimes retires rules that that you know after being in production for some period of time, maybe are no longer a good idea for for one reason or the other. So these are maintained aggressively and and on a um, a daily basis. Uh, and, and yeah, we're working on other things as well. So, um, you know, as we add new capabilities to our MDR um, uh, offering at Soteria, uh, we're always looking to partner with Lima Charlie and bring, uh, you know, these capabilities to their customers as well. So I think we'll be seeing some more, um, some more rule sets uh, dropping hopefully in the next couple of months. Awesome. Love it. Good stuff. Well, with that said, everyone, uh, you know, Paul, a huge thanks for, for, for joining me here. Um, I, I've really really enjoyed like being able to kind of sit and talk to you, talk with you through this and, and look at it and, and just, you know, start to think about ways that you guys are offering a ridiculous amount of value here to, to the industry. I'm loving it. Um, number one, number two, for folks out there, who have got those O365 um, instances or got those O365 data streams that you want to kind of dig into. And I'm noticing that I'm severely out of focus. There we go. Um, but uh, feel free to go ahead and grab this rule set and check it out. And then last but certainly not least, uh, you know, Soteri, this is not your first foray into Lima Charlie. There's EDR curated rule sets. You guys have got the O365, or sorry, 365 inspect out there. A huge thank you to you from the community here of all the awesome stuff that you guys do. So so thanks for being here. And uh, thanks for, for letting me walk through this with you, Paul. It's been great. Yeah, likewise, Matt. Love the partnership with Lima Charlie. Love working with you guys and, and can't wait to build the next thing on top of your platform. Awesome. Looking forward to it. All right. So I'll let you get back to chilly Charleston and I'll head back to uh, disgustingly chilly Dallas. So <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Paul. Take care. Yeah.